So I think you all know that Australia has extremely sophisticated and deep capital markets, and, and many of the banks here have participated in offshore wind finance uh, in other markets around the world, but um, it's new here. It's never been done. And so every time it's done in a market, there are things to learn, lessons from overseas, um, and things to deal with from unique nature of each market. So I've got a great set of panelists here. What I'd like to do is have everybody just do a brief introduction and say, what kind of lessons learned overseas can be applied here to the uniqueness of the Australian market? Maybe I'll start at the far end, Patrick. Um, yeah, so, so of course there's a lot of experiences from, from Europe that we have to draw on uh, for the Australian market. So there's a buildup of a sort of stable and clear pathway to what kind of projects are we looking into, what kind of uh, uh, scale are we looking into, and what kind of offtake are you getting, what kind of grid connections are you getting, uh, and sort of that clarity that Europe has been providing in, in different markets has led the way to offshore wind expanding in Europe, and now recently we've seen Taiwan doing something similar with a clear uh, feed-in tariff structure that's enabled them to uh, get the local supply chain going. And, and I guess that's, that's the key point, and it will be a recurring topic on, on this panel, that, that clarity of, of, uh, of, of feed-in tariff systems and, and supply chain uh, is really what's created the market for offshore wind in, in other markets. Uh, so I'm Daniel Nugent, Head of uh, Portfolio Development at Energy Australia. Um, I think when we look at the Australian context, it's really important to get the, uh, I guess, the auction and the offtake structure right. Um, and so I think it'd be really important to, to look at um, lessons learned from overseas and, and what we can apply to Australia. And I think, um, you know, clearly, uh, projects that, you know, these projects are going to need to be project financed and which obviously requires, um, you know, very stable revenue to, to deliver the lowest cost of, of capital. And so I think getting, making sure that um, we really get the, uh, the balance of the risk allocation through those revenue structures is absolutely key. Um, you know, they need to be credit worthy. Um, and, but, you know, there, there should be also an appropriate risk allocation um, to, uh, you know, either customers, uh, retailers, um, or government that, that enables the projects to, to reach financial close. Yeah, I think the, uh, so first of all, my name is Thomas and I'm from, from CIP, um, covering uh, Asia Pacific for, uh, for CIP's flagship funds. Um, I think looking at what, what has been said already, I think clearly uh, visibility, clarity, uh, from the market to developers to the supply chain, I think is the most important things for um, for everyone to take risk, get started. You need to know uh, by this date you can participate in these auctions for offtake. By this date, we want to have uh, first power of X gigawatt, uh, and and we really need to see progress and a clear way through all of those steps. Hi, I'm Kimberly Cram, one of the co-founders of Kima Energy. I'm part of the Eleonora Offshore Consortium with Dan and the team, uh, Energy Australia. Um, so my kind of background has been developing projects in the UK and then Taiwan for the last six years. And I think what's quite consistent around all, all kind of European, American, um, APAC uh, markets is that real need for consistency, whether that's in the framework, whether it's in the supply chain, having that real kind of viability of the market depends on the kind of core fundamentals. Do we have good policy, which clearly Australia is targeting and doing a very good kind of job of having that visibility on, on the framework. Um, and once we've got past that, then you know, how attractive is the market? And I think my view is at least Australia is incredibly attractive, very sophisticated from a, a financing perspective. There are many lenders here, um, while they've obviously not done offshore wind in Australia yet, um, have been very active in Europe and particularly in Taiwan. Um, so there's that kind of knowledge of the markets already, the knowledge of what it takes to successfully deliver projects. Um, but also I think that that comes with a certain kind of awareness of some of the challenges. Um, you know, we've seen even onshore projects here, and many of the kind of big Australian banks have been part of those projects. 
And you know, you've got clarity on um, consenting, but then you know, projects can be operational and they're curtailed. Um, so there are some, some challenges there. Um, with offshore wind, same in Taiwan, some um, good kind of progress there, but obviously some projects that have, have suffered some delay. So there's a lot of lessons learned, and I think that will look at the, the framework, it will look at the supply chain, particularly it will be looking at what's the expertise, where are the skills to deliver offshore wind projects, uh, and that's clearly a kind of a gap that's still still here in Australia, but we're looking to obviously fill that, bring in expertise and working locally on skills. Um, so I think, yeah, there's kind of real, I think, real kind of optimism, um, but we have to bring those lessons learned from elsewhere, making sure that the fundamentals on grids, on ports, are really addressed quite early on. Um, but I do think financing as well, I know we're you know, kind of five plus years from financial close, but actually really thinking about the funding strategy now, risk allocation, supplier selection, all of that has to be built in already. So good that we're having that conversation and not leaving it too late. Um, Ian Malouche from Macquarie Capital. So I head um, debt capital markets for Macquarie Capital in Australia and New Zealand and work on uh, wind and other renewable projects sort of here and up, up in Asia as well. I think from that financing perspective, sort of pick up on the, the point Kimberly made around risk allocation, I think that's really critical um, to ensure that the financing markets can support the projects. And I think what's been learned and seen in a lot of the offshore oil projects is perhaps not all the risks have been really understood um, in each of the projects and um, in many cases, um, you know, how those risks, those residual risks have been allocated have not been to the right party uh, who's been able to either sort of fund or provide, you know, clarity or certainty around that. And I think to ensure the financing markets do support it, it's been very sort of clear that there's been a lot of work around all of those risks and ensuring that the parties that are best able to take those risks, price those risks and allocate those risks to those parties um, to ensure that, you know, what is the sort of the start of this journey and the, the momentum that you can feel around this sector is able to be delivered on by the financing markets. And I think those finance markets will support it, um, having seen what's gone on offshore in, in other jurisdictions to you know, have that right risk allocation to, to ensure that the, the market's there and the capital's there. And lucky last, after all of those things that have been said, um, my name's Melissa Kane. I'm a partner in the projects team at Allens, currently based in Melbourne, but I have also worked up in Vietnam and in Japan for a number of years, including an early stage offshore wind in Vietnam. So a few lessons learned through that process. Um, but one thing I've learned, I think even over the last couple of days hearing yesterday with some of the learnings um, from the APAC region, is that consultation is going to be key and asking questions like this in the proper forums is going to be really important. So listening to the State of Victoria earlier with Aang saying about her consultation on the um, support mechanism of just making sure that we bring along the financiers early in the piece, not just the developers, um, to find out what they will need to finance the projects because at the end of the day, it is gonna be the key to getting these projects off the ground. Absolutely. So just to be clear, um, we want to hear from the audience. So there's two ways that you can do that. You can come down to the mics. There's mics at each level. Um, I also have an iPad here where you can, and you can go into the program app and you can see live Q&A uh, under this session and you can type in a question. So please type in a question because we actually want to hear what you're thinking and what you want answered rather than just us up here talking. Um, in the prep session, we talked about state support, and I know some of you have mentioned state support. It's pretty hard to imagine offshore wind taking off in Australia without state support. Almost every market globally starts with some level of state support. Maybe can we talk about what that looks like, um, what you would prefer to see, and how long it needs to last? Because usually when there's state support, there is a, a plan to wind it down as the market matures, costs are reduced. Uh, risks are understood, et cetera, and allocated to the right people. So maybe, Mel, I'll start with you, and we go back the other way, and then what does state support look like here? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to take all the points. I'll just do a couple, so I leave plenty open for the rest of the panel. 
Um, but I think Jonathan Cole put it really well yesterday and again today um, about getting the timing right. So it's been fantastic to see Victoria acknowledging that state support is going to be required for this industry and really getting some momentum around what it looks like, implementation statement three coming through later this year. Um, but we do want to make sure these things don't jumpstart too early. And if they do, if they are ahead of the curve for some projects, that there's a certainty around what it might look like through the next phase. Will there be more open and offered, you know, for the same projects, let's say, in the Gippsland area? Or if they miss this first round, is that it? So just being really transparent um, on the process. Um, similarly for New South Wales, I think it's a real challenge at the moment for the Hunter applicants. Um, because there isn't any visibility on that state support yet. So at least having some level of um, openness around what might be offer on offer, so that when people are coming up with their route to market strategy, they're not having to make things up or invent potential offtakes or, or trying to all lock in different um, partners on and stepping over each other for MOUs. So that's my bit. Yeah, picking up that offtake point, that, that's, and I'll again, try to be generous and leave some other points for those further along is, I think that around offtake will be really critical. Um, there's um, obviously a, a broader sort of value proposition for economies around the development of the sector and ensuring that the governments, you know, provide that support. I think initially through that offtake will provide that sort of certainty to ensure again there's a there's a financeable proposition. Yeah, I'd probably kind of echo your point, Mel, on timing. Um, when I was doing kind of offshore wind in the early days in the UK, we went from real kind of, you know, field of dreams moments on the kind of tariff we had. The rock regime, for those who remember it, you built your project, you got your tariff, nice and easy. And then along came CFD. It kind of started off sounding quite attractive. You had your kind of um, cap and collar, and then you realised there was an auction process attached to it, um, which I think most of us actually back in 2014 were quite surprised by that. Um, and obviously the impact has then been that some projects were delayed, some really good, credible projects, um, obviously we've had to wait for that regime. But now that we're all used to it, I think just having that clarity again on what is the regime and when does it happen, you know, going too early and you haven't really done your kind of due diligence on the project, have you gone out to the market, have you understood your costs, how much have you engaged with lenders to understand your cost of capital? So if you're putting together something like a CFD, without the kind of real metrics on your business case, it's hard to know what your tariff is. But likewise, if you leave it far too late, you can't really progress the development of the project. If you're spending a couple of hundred million, you need certainty behind that, knowing that it's worth spending it because you will ultimately have a project. Um, so yeah, I think you know, there's a lot of talk that we'll likely have a CFD here. Um, that, that's fine, I think that can work as long as we know when it will happen and what the criteria are and then we can really kind of plan projects around it. But yeah, timing and clarity, I think, is really the kind of key theme that's coming out over the last couple of days. Yeah, I mean, I, I would also agree to all of that, and I think the CFD sort of structure is, is very well suited for, for these type of projects. And if you look at the most successful and mature uh, offshore market, the UK, they, they, start, they have a CFD structure in place, and despite them being by far the most mature market, they continue to apply the CFD structure to to, um, to realize their projects. And I think there are many reasons for, for this. Uh, if, you, if you really rely on, on, on other structures or feed-in premiums or corporate PPAs, I think you are, as a nation, also running the risk that these projects will not happen. And so it really depends on what, what is the most important uh, objective here. Is it to realize these projects or is it providing um, the developers with, with, an, with basically an option, which I think uh, will be the case if you look at some of the sort of the most recent uh, auctions, uh, especially in Europe, where uh, there's a big question mark whether these projects are viable or not. Yeah, so um, I think with the state support and government support, I think it depends on uh, the stage of the project um, that it's up to. So obviously during the um, development phase, I think there's you know really a, a role for government there around um, approvals and, and licenses. Um, I think when you're you know, into the, um, the execution phase, I think it's, um, you, know, sh you know, as the industry is evolving, I think obviously the first projects will, um, you know, potentially be the, the more expensive ones and have um, sort of the most uncertainty and the most execution risk. So perhaps there's um, sort of some state support or government support in regards to managing that execution risk. 
Um, but then when we you know, get to the um, sort of the revenue side and um, support around that, I think you know people um, uh, we're talking about CFDs and structures, and I think um, it's also important to. Um, not have all the risk transferred uh, to government, which ultimately is taxpayers. I think um, you know there's, there's certainly a role for uh, retailers to play in that, and and uh, and customers. So we obviously have a large mass market customer base, a large um, C and I customer base, and, and we think that the right model is being able to work with those customers um, to be able to. Um, I guess put forward something that's uh, attractive and manages a lot of that risk as well. And so in combination with, um, I guess, customers' requirements, because ultimately that's why we're building this, is for our customers, um, uh, in combination with potentially some, you know, back-end government support, we think that's uh, the right model that will um, give the project certainty. A lot of good points. <laughs> um, I, I think the only thing to add is, is that to your original question was for how long do you need state aid or state support for? Well, until the technology is competitive in its own right towards other technologies. And it was the same for onshore wind, it was the same for other technologies. You needed to support them until they were competitive. Now solar PV and onshore wind are the most competitive energy sources for new, new build in Australia. Um, that's 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 a massive feat that that Australia has completed, and uh, and you see the the mix, the energy mix in Australia is uh, is very much supported by by the renewable energy side. The same thing needs to happen for offshore wind. There needs to be state aid, uh, state support until offshore wind is a successful sector on its own and can really provide uh, sort of generation capacity to the grid at a low cost. That takes time. It takes time to build up a supply chain. It's taken. Yeah, since 1992 in Europe with Vindeby. Uh, now we have a sort of more mature sector of offshore sector in, in Europe where, where, as Thomas mentioned, there are, there are uh, negative bets now. You pay to have the, uh, the, the, the lease of the seabed. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of support. So Australia is looking in, in for, this is a long-term view that Australia needs to take in order to support the sector to get to the point where it's competitive in its own right. So we have a, a question from the audience, and again, I encourage you to submit questions. It's how can financing an offshore wind draw experience from onshore renewables, and what are the key differences you've seen between offshore versus onshore financing in Australia? I, I will That's add one to, for Patrick. I, I will, say again? <laughs> That's one for Patrick. Okay. I, I, will add, I will add a little bit more to that because some of you have already mentioned, you know, there's a huge penetration of, of onshore wind and solar. Add to that a, a relatively small load over a relatively large area, certainly if you compare that to Europe or, or North America, and then it's a relatively small number of players. So, so the banks here are very comfortable with onshore, so apply all that together. And, and, and what are, the, are there lessons actually from the onshore that would apply to the offshore here, given all those complications? Yeah, I, okay, I, I, might, I might take a... Uh, the, the position I think that will be challenging when we move to this offshore is that you know, um, financiers, markets, capital is very used to you know, this EPC wrap for contracts and it's very sort of relatively simple construction and there's one party that will wrap all of that risk. And I think that's obviously not what happens in offshore um, uh, globally. Um, and how financiers can get comfortable with that when we've obviously seen the issues that have happened with the gaps between uh, can, those can you explain just just on that point between the wraps can you just explain why that matters here and and, and what the differences yeah, are well, between from on and, offshore? and there'll be probably a number in the room um, you know they can look at a very sort of simple contractor replacement analysis and say <laughs> this contractor goes bankrupt um, we, one person come in and replace it we've got this number of guarantees we can pull from this person there's no interface risks between contracts it's this contractor, they're responsible for everything. We'll so so onshore is usually a typical one EPC, yep. one person, one entity responsible. One entity responsible. Offshore, it's multiple. Yes, with, with offshore, there's going to be multiple and there's going to be interface risk between, okay, well, if this has happened here, if you haven't got your boat because it's typhoon season in Taiwan, oh, okay, what happens? Who's going to sort of fill that gap? Um, how does that all work? And the interconnectedness between that, that interface, that, that's, I think, the issue that will be challenging for the financing markets here because they haven't, grown up and they're not used to that, understanding that risk. And unfortunately, well, you could say unfortunately, I'm going to be glass half full because I'm an optimist is, I think it's actually good there's been probably problems offshore because those lessons will be learned 
and when capital and finance is looking at it in this market, they say, okay, we've seen what's gone wrong offshore, we've seen the issues, let's make sure we, we do it right here. But I, I think my view, at least, is the technology is almost kind of irrelevant to how you actually deliver and fund a project. Yes, offshore wind is no doubt much more complicated as we've all kind of gone through the lessons learned. But really, you're kind of looking at, again, the core kind of basics of, you know, do you have a good framework in place? Is it part of the energy mix? What's your route to market? Do you have grid? And what will happen once you actually build your project? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges here is that onshore at least has suffered with you know, constructed projects that are operational, that have a certain business case behind it, and then they're curtailed for quite significant periods. And how do you build in that risk into your model? How do the lenders get comfort that they're going to get repaid? That's ultimately what we have to do. Um, so, you know, technology aside, I think the basics are still there. We still have to kind of work through that uh, and just make sure there is that stability and that once you build a project, it can operate. You can have a good revenue stream through your combination of merchant, CPPA, uh, CFD, um, but you need that certainty. It's got, it's got to be there, whichever technology we use. Maybe just one comment to the to the multi-contracting versus the EPC rep. Um, so, it, it has been said already, it hasn't happened in the offshore offshore side, and there's there's good reasons for that. Simply, no one can do it. The price would be so high that the projects are not viable. But also, I think it's it's important to note that I'm not sure it, it really what you want to have. I think what's important is that the risks are the risks, and if someone wraps it, the risks are still there. You just believe that they can manage them better than you can. And, and I think that's definitely not the case if you look at how projects are being executed. What's important for how the banks should look at this, uh, the ECA should look at this, that is they need to take a much more diligent view of who is it that delivers the projects, who is it who manages the interfaces between the contracts. This has been done many times, and each time it goes wrong, it's not a country, it's not a country risk. It's, a, it's, it's basically a delivery risk by the, by the individual sponsors. Anyone else want to, to touch on that? Well, the, the, the question was sort of what's the big difference between onshore and, and offshore wind, right? And, and, and there's, besides from all the points that all have been mentioned, there's just a matter of size. Offshore wind is just so much bigger. It's a massive capex investments. It's utility scale. And often you want more clarity on, on sort of the revenue stream. So we go back to the clarity on sort of what does the Victorian or Australian government wants to do? What are the support re regimes look like? But, but in that perspective, you typically see that offshore wind is financed with a full project finance throughout the sort of the, the, the life of the project. So you see tenors that are construction plus 15, 20 years, whereas onshore wind in Australia for the projects we uh, finance is often with a mini perm structure where there's a refi after five years or after seven years. So there's a, there's a built-in refinancing risk in the onshore projects. Banks can take a view saying, well, it's a very liquid market. We can get our heads around it. When we're talking sizes of two, three billion US dollars, I'm looking to you, Thomas, what the CAPEX are on, on, on the projects in, in Australia, then, then banks want often more clarity when it's these kind of long tenders we're looking into. And that would be a key di differentiator between onshore wind and offshore wind financing. Any other thoughts on this or are we? Okay, <clears throat> I think the next question is, uh, you've all heard supply chain challenges that have been faced by the OEMs. Um, most of the OEMs price or, or their costs are in US dollars. And when, over the last few years, they have been burned very badly because of you know, supply chain and logistics challenges and price, price increases between quoting and delivery. So they're, they're now pushing a lot of those risks down onto the developers. Of course, here, the offtake is in Aussie dollars. The capital cost of a lot of the equipment is US dollars. So explain how you think these first projects will get structured and, and the, the forex risks hedged. Who, who, anybody want to, okay, Thomas? No, I can give that a go. So yeah, so you have that as a developer all the way up to a financial close, you will sit with that FX exposure, but you also sit with other commodity exposures, which obviously is a, is a, a significant part of your, your development, um, development strategy, but also uh, in terms of just understanding what it is that you're undertaking. But what, how it's usually being done, mostly because the lenders will require this, but also the sponsors want this, you will enter into hedges. So at financial close, all of the, the capex will be hedged into the currency of the offtake. Um, and most likely, at least what we have done in, in a number of deals in the past is that we actually enter into deal contingent hedges. So we, we, we mitigate that risk uh, 
hopefully months in advance of financial close, simply to have that certainty uh, transferred to someone else. Um, I'd maybe kind of just add on to that. A really a big part of the cost is obviously from the supply chain, uh, and that will depend where they're located, where they're manufacturing. Um, and I think, you know, clearly if you're importing, we're dealing with, we're usually kind of used to you know, a basket of Euro, USD, all kind of mixed currencies. But then when you look at how that combines with local content, um, you know, if you're looking for a kind of real push on local content, that clearly affects pricing and where you're sourcing from. Um, what we find in Taiwan, you know, the government, I'm not sure if you're aware, but they're looking for 60% local content, um, which is very ambitious. I can see why they're doing it, but it just simply doesn't work. Um, they're looking at a supply chain now where the cost of a jacket has gone up two to 300% compared to international prices. And um, because those local suppliers are guaranteed work, they know that the developers have to use them. Um, so you're then building that into your business case, which is just really not viable. Um, but then on top of that, because you're having to use local content, you can't bring in ECAs. You're really limiting your choice, which then impacts on the cost of debt. Um, and again, at the moment, that's going up probably 50% because you're not having ECAs available because you, know, you can't go to Korea, you can't go to Japan, wherever you know, kind of good ECAs, and back in Europe as well, and Denmark very much in the kind of forefront of offshore wind. <laughs> um, but you know, if you can't have that kind of international supply chain, there's no international ECAs coming in, cost of debt goes up, the projects just become that much more challenging. Um, so I think all of this really has to be looked at in combination of how you have that stability in the framework, you have a very clear supply chain, you've got a very clear financing strategy, and we're all doing that to make sure we can bring down the cost. But it has to go hand in hand. Yeah, but I'm going to jump in on, on a couple of the points here as well. I think that um, pulling in the earlier threads sort of around government support as well, so Kimberly, one of the points you made earlier around you know that time frame from when you get awards to when you actually start getting construction to when you actually have to start transferring this FX risk. Um, uh, you know, are there mechanisms for governments to you know, sort of mitigate that, they're obviously deriving the broader benefits from you know, decarbonisation, from jobs, from local content. Now, is there roles for government to take, you know, manage some of that risk um, and say, look, okay, we're doing a, a CFD at this price, but we will adjust it if it goes past this date for your financial close and the USD rate has changed to X or the price is still run X and you have inflators in that. That's obviously, you know, if there is a strong desire from government to really support, to look at those mechanisms Because we all know it is very difficult from, on the costs involved from, you know, getting a bid in and saying, well, we'll do it at this price and then actually getting through, through to close. I wish we had somebody from government to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Deliberately noting <laughs> that they're not here so much as you, when they're not on the panel with us. Any, anybody else want to comment on that? Yes, yeah, so again, I'd maybe kind of go back to the UK, Taiwan examples, but you know, in the UK with CFD, having it indexed is really important. Taiwan was the opposite with the kind of early uh, PPAs with Thai power. There was no indexation. Um, and, you know, a lot has changed clearly in the last few years. So I think now the likes of, you know, the kind of big semiconductor industries that everyone's going to for CPPAs, they're thinking they shouldn't put indexation into the CPPA. And that's just not viable. Um, so there's definitely options there. We've got good at kind of examples from other markets that we can use and should use. And presumably, I think Dan and the team will be looking into kind of how that is structured in combination with CFD and kind of how we just make sure that everything fits together. But it has to be thought out very early, um, basically now, I think. And I don't think you want um, these projects and developers to be pricing in all that risk at the start because that's not attractive for, for anyone. So I think, yeah, it comes back to that, um, that appropriate risk allocation and how that could be managed from... Um, you know, the point of development through to investment decision and then construction. Great, okay. <clears throat> it is the um, Offshore Wind and Green Hydrogen Summit, so I, I have to ask about hydrogen. Does anybody think that hydrogen is going to be relevant as offtake for offshore wind projects in the next 10 years? Not in Australia. <laughs> But, but, yeah. maybe in, but maybe in Europe, and, and, and I think in particular in the North Sea in, in Europe, uh, that there's a clear match to there's an oversupply of electricity at, at specific points in, in three, four years' time down, down the line, there'll be an oversupply, and then there's a perfect natural match to the, to the grid issues we'll see otherwise towards green hydrogen. So in Europe, we're going to see it, but it's going to take some time before it comes to Australia. Yeah, no, I would very much agree with that. I mean, it's, 
I think those uh, considerations are relatively mature in sort of the, the North European market in terms of so where you have periods where the price is either negative or, or, or very low, uh, you, you, would, you would produce hydrogen. Uh, this, this is, I think, the projects are not happening tomorrow, but those uh, contracting uh, considerations are, are quite mature, I would say. Anyone else? Okay, we have one question um, on fixed versus floating. Do we have a view on the difference in state support required between fixed and floating? And should that influence the priorities in the delivery of supporting infrastructure, for example, grid? I would also add ports, right, the difference between fixed and floating port requirements. So anybody want to take that on? I'm, I'm happy to start. I think it's, um, um, it's very clear that Floating will be an important technology for, for offshore wind in uh, many markets. Uh, but I don't think it will be the first choice for uh, technology in, in Australia. Um, the, 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 floating, the floating technology is there, but it's, it's slowly maturing. And, and we will start to see, uh, we have seen the demo projects in, in North Europe. We've seen a few in, in Northeast Asia. Uh, there are many projects under development. but. But in terms of cost competitiveness to the fixed bottom, uh, there's still still some way to go, and uh, and therefore, in terms of if the question is whether what to prioritise first for Australia in terms of uh, infrastructure, port upgrade, uh, supply chain considerations, uh, I think it's a relatively easy answer, at least from my side, to 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 prioritise sort of fixed bottom first because there's so many good sites here that is suitable for this. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in just because Australia does have some interesting differences to parts of Europe because where we are a federal system where the state supports will be done at state level and if we're looking at the geography or the, uh, of, or the topology of the um, Gippsland area versus Hunter, one in Gippsland will be fixed bottom and they'll all be fixed bottom so the state support doesn't need to differentiate the technology and then when you go to New South Wales it'll be all floating so therefore the state support won't differentiate the technology but it may indeed need to be a higher price if those projects are going to get off the ground just because of how young the industry is in that regard. One thing I am interested to know just with some of the panellists up here, this is totally not a financing question, but is the vessel supply chain issue diminished in some way by floating instead of fixed bottom jackets and things like that? Like is it just because you won't need to have the, I don't know, will you not need to have the vessels in play as long for a floating technology? Yeah, I think the whole kind of logistics piece is a real kind of work in progress. I think just kind of coming back to your point, just to kind of wrap that one up, um, you know, if you're looking at kind of the cost of these projects, you know, going from jackets at 2,000 tonnes of steel to fixed bottom at 4,000 tonnes of steel, that is not bringing the cost down. Not yet. It will come, for sure, but it needs time. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite keen that we actually start looking at foundations design, not having 100 different designs. There's got to be some real progress there, and all of that will drive down the cost. Um, yeah, grid infrastructure to keep up with any region that we're developing has to move quickly. Ports have to move quickly. Um, we're just not ready for floating. But again, all of this will come. Um, yeah, from a supply chain perspective, one of the reasons in our consortium is that we have Buscalis and um, their fleet of 650 vessels is to deal with that very real issue right now around the availability of vessels. There's such big constraints. Um, so I think depending on kind of the timing of when these projects come online, we'll still you know, be comp competing against other markets. Vessels will still be a challenge. Will it be to the same extent? I think possibly not. Um, but yeah, there's still some, some way to go on that. Uh, I was just going to say that I guess, um, you know, the value of the megawatt hour produced on a fixed first a, a floating is, um, is no different. So I think when you look at, um, you know, the what should be prioritised first, I think it's uh, completely sensible that um, fixed bottom um, is prioritised. And you can see that sort of with the Gippsland um, being the, the first feasibility licence. So I think um, clearly, you know, the industry is going to develop and evolve, but, um, you know, it, it does make sense that we um, are working with the technology that, um, you know, has the lowest delivered cost as a first priority. Well, we, um, we, we, we participated in our first financing of a floating wind project in, in France, and, and one of the learning is called the EFGL project, but one of the learnings from that project goes back to Thomas' point on saying, 
you still need the same supply chain on everything else, basically. So you need to build up the whole supply chain and then add some for, for extra things you need for floating. And before, Australia has built up a, a sort of a local supply chain for all the OMM sensors and transformer station and grid supplies and all that. Then you can add the additional things you need for, for floating because it's just an additional cost, but it's additional supply that you need uh, to build up before you can do floating. <clears throat> what, I think, Daniel, you mentioned uh, CNI customers. If you look um, in, in Europe, there's a very big move towards offshore wind feeding into corporate PPAs. When's that going to be relevant here? I mean, I, I'm guessing that the first, and I know a lot of the onshore solar and wind um, do corporate PPAs. So is that going to be relevant here in the near term, or is it, is it a longer term issue yeah. here for the, for the offtake finan and financing? I can probably start on that one. So the, um, I think, you know, and that is something that has certainly evolved in the onshore um, space in, in Australia. But I think um, when we think about CNI customers, um, particularly in Australia, I think you also need to look at the, uh, the term that they're prepared to contract. And so, um, you know, they, the CNI market in Australia is pretty much looking at sort of five to ten year terms. Um, and when we're looking at trying to underpin um, the financing of these projects, you'll need a lot more certainty than five to ten years. Um, you know, that's where I think the likes of Energy Australia can play a role in that aggregation of mass market customers and CNI customers to deliver um, something longer term, um, you know, in combination with an element of, of government support. So I think it, it can play uh, a role, um, you know, either directly or, or more likely through the aggregation of, um, of retailers. Um, but I think, um, you know, the challenge will be on a direct CNI customer for an underpinning of project financing will be the term that they're prepared to commit to. Yeah, I think as well from a, if you're a corporate and, um, no, Macquarie myself, we've been involved in a number of the corporate PPA, some of the first ones that, that were developed in this market. Um, uh, you know, they're looking for that diversity of supply um, and, you know, to provide the scale for one of the offshore winds that have to be a very large portion probably of their energy needs and be dependent on one project, I think it would leave them very exposed. And I, as, as we saw with I think, the onshore market, it was the Gentilers that took that risk up front because they had a portfolio of um, generation assets and, you know, if there was a delay with... 300 megawatts coming on here, that was okay. But if you're a corporate and you're taking 75 of that and that's sort of all your load, that's very hard risk position. So I think it will be time before that comes in. It might be when some of that government support starts to tail off. Like as you mentioned sort of earlier, that's when the corporate PPAs may come in. But again, for larger corporates where you know they can you know, see that it's built, given you know there'll be plenty of examples offshore where there's been delays, and then get comfortable that you know that that power will be able to be delivered. Um, so I think you know, the Gentiles play a key, key part in the share front. Yeah, I, I think, in my, my view at least, is we will need a combination of merchant, CFD, CPPA, um, but actually finding that magic mix of the kind of key five ingredients to get a really good off-taker, it's quite difficult. You know, have you got someone that will take a good capacity? They want it 24-7, will they pay a good price on it, etc. Credit risk. Um, it's quite difficult to find that, actually. Taiwan was a good example of that um, with TSMC, but I think that's a bit of a unicorn. Um, yeah. But finding that combination is going to be key, I think. Yeah, what Kimberly's talking about is TSMC in Taiwan is the largest CPPA in the world. They take 920 megawatts from one project, they finance the whole project, and they don't take 24-7. So if you had to do 24-7, it would be a much more complicated issue. We are out of time, so I'm going to ask one last question. You have five to ten seconds to answer it. I'll start with Mel. First FID, financial investment, final investment decision on offshore wind, what year? In Australia. <laughs> 2028. 27, I'll be more optimistic. I'm the lawyer. <laughs> um, given that we haven't gone through consenting yet, that will probably take about three years, um, two years beyond that for financial close. So yeah, I think five years, so 2028. 12 to 18 months after the first auction. <laughs> 28 to 30. 28. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Please uh, put your hands together and, and, and thank the panel. It was a great panel.